Hello everybody, welcome back to Best Books Ever. I'm Tyler, and today we are finishing Sea of Monsters, Rick Riordan, chapters 11 through 20. Um, this was great. This was awesome. Um, this is really, you know, I think book one was obviously, like any book one does, it really sets the stage for, you know, characters, world, you know, maybe get into a little scuffle here and there in the first book. Normally a lot, not a lot of stakes, right? Oh, that's okay. It's the first book, especially, you know, five book series, right? I think the longer the series is, um, the more true that is. But then you get to book two, and I think it's true for this one where it's like, okay, this is really the beginning, maybe even like the end of act one, if you think of it in like the three act structure, almost the end of act one where it's like, okay, we've kind of gone through all the preliminary stuff, which is all really great. But now this is, this, this kicks off everything else that the series is going to be. Um, clearly by the way, this book ends, um, which I guess is where we'll start, start with the end. Um, biggest thing, Thalia is back. Thalia is back. Um, daughter of Zeus, she's alive opens up a lot of interesting, um, I guess, like, different possibilities for what's going to happen uh, from here on out, right? So we have the thing that everyone is scared of, especially Chiron, you know, because he knows the, uh, the, the prophecy. I mean, I guess anyone who knows the prophecy is, like, super scared of this. Everyone else is kind of shocked. <laughs> They're like, hmm, that's, you know, they either know of, of Thalia and they're like, that's not supposed to be, or they don't and they're like, who is this person? Either way, crazy stuff. But people like Chiron, Annabeth, uh, Percy now, I think Grover also knows, maybe. Maybe. I think Grover might know. We'll see. Um, Child of the Big Three is supposed to either save the world or destroy it, you know, whatever. And so Percy's been the only one of that. Tyson technically, but they're like, eh, it's half-bloods. Tyson's not really, it's not really who who counts. Percy, and throughout this book, um, it just goes, you know, there's more and more evidence that, okay, clearly Percy not going to, uh, you know, not going to side with Kronos, right? So like, okay, cool, that's, that's good. You know, now that, you know, kind of like initial worry is hopefully out of the way. And now we can just kind of focus on training Percy and making it so they can face off against Kronos and whoever, right? Don't have to worry about that prophecy, that part of the prophecy coming true. Um, now, unfortunately, you know, I mean, this is the unfortunate side of things. The whole, you know, Thalia being back isn't unfortunate, but the, you know, the kind of uh, bad part about this is that we were pretty sure about Percy, not side of him, Kronos. Thalia, we're not sure. We don't know. Again, you would like to think that no Half-Blood would, um, but then you look at Luke and it's like, you know, I'm look at Thalia and it's like, probably won't, you know, you'd like to think she wouldn't, especially like her being, I, I, I don't know though, who, um, who turned to a tree? <laughs> oh yeah, I guess, I guess the gods did right as like punishment so in the same uh you know in the same thought you know the, the same train of thought as luke thalia could be upset with the gods turning her into a tree why don't we stop with chronos very bad stuff because now she's another you know child of the big three and it could now be her that sides that that is is in the prophecy and it's not percy you know um, I don't know, man. I don't know. That, that That's crazy. I mean, also her just being here, like she's another powerful one against Child of the Big Three. So she's going to be innately powerful, just like Percy is. Uh, it'd be interesting. Like, what does she know? Like, was she cognizant when she was a tree? Or is she going to wake up and be like, you know, like she was in a coma for the whole time. She's like, what happened? Um, how will she feel towards... Annabeth, Luke, and Grover, you know, the, the last three people she saw before she got, uh, turned to a tree, um, and I guess, like, is she gonna have an opinion 
out of like like right at the gate and be like, "Hey, Luke, you know, Luke making some good points." Or maybe she'll be like, "That's crazy." <laughs> um, I do love how how like Percy ends it though, where 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 he's like, "This is either going to be my best friend or my worst enemy," and it's true. Um. You know, again, if, if she is part of the prophecy, then it's like she will either help save the world or destroy the world. And uh, we're, not, we're not sure which one yet, but, you know, that's huge. Um, you know, you know, I'm kind of like putting that into our minds, even in book one of like, oh, it's a tree. And we kind of, I don't remember, did we learn about, you know, Thalia is the tree in book one? I'm, I'm pretty sure we did. Um, but yeah, it's just like, ah, this is here now, you know, crazy stuff. Um. But other than that, because that's not the only thing that happened, not the only thing that will carry us through to the rest of the series, uh, we got a bunch of other stuff that happened as well. Um, there was the brace yourself message from Poseidon. Now, I'm not sure, looking at how the book ends, you could interpret that as him maybe foreseeing this and him being like, oof. Thali is going to be back, you know, um, that's what you got to brace yourself for, or maybe it's something in the future, maybe it is another quest, you know, Percy seems to go on a quest every book, so I'm sure next book will have a quest, I'd be shocked if it didn't, um, it's, it, it, I mean, on a grander scale, it's just like, oh, Kronos, brace yourself, you know, but that, that would be weird to send a message about that, I think the Thali thing is probably the clearest connection like, hey, this, this is going to get crazy. She's here now, and she, she's going to mess everything up in good ways and bad ways. Um, or again, maybe it's just a quest. Well, we'll see, you know. Next book is called Titan's Curse. Not sure what that means. Doesn't sound good. Um, unless there's a curse on the Titan. Cronus is a Titan. That'd be a win for us. Uh, but the Titan gives the curse if it's the one giving the curse. Not good. Not good. Uh, but brace yourself. And then, you know, I do also like that as well because... I love the, like, mixed feelings that Percy continues to have about Poseidon because he's, you know, after all this time, right, he's still not sure how to feel, you know, because, like, even in this moment, um, when he does get the letter and everything, thinks about it, mulls it over, and it's, like, immediately upset. It's like, oh, why, you know? why'd you send this letter, you know, like, why couldn't we talk, even you send in the letter, like, why is it only two words, you couldn't have said anything else to me, um, you know, we never see each other, um, you know, you, you, you know, you never, I don't know, there's a lot of, like, you know, obviously, like, ab abandonment issues, right, um, that affects both him and, and his mother, uh, but then he thinks about it, it's like, well, I mean, he does have these cool Poseidon powers, you know, we did get Tyson, the hippocampi or whatever did come to help. So, eh, you know, Poseidon is there. He is doing things. It's very tough, very, very tough relationship between them. But yeah, I mean, it does go to show that uh, at the very least, Poseidon is thinking about him. Now, what are the intentions, right? Like, is he's paying special attention to Percy just because of the situation? It's like, well, there's this whole kind of like end of the world sort of thing that's happening. And whether you're in the prophecy or not, you're still a pretty important part of it. What are the intentions, you know? But I don't think it's fair to say that Poseidon doesn't care at all about Percy and doesn't pay attention at all about, uh, you know, you know, to him because that's just not true. Um, yeah, I do love that, that, that kind of fight, though, where Percy, the character, is not settled yet. You know, um, it's cool. Um, some highs at the end. Uh, well, I guess there's some lows, but let's, let's start with something really quick. Uh, Annabeth uh, does kiss Percy on the cheek at the end. Very excited, very caught up in the moment. Um, but I do think... You know, if we're, we're going to get into the whole relationship thing, I, I do think, you know, especially with it starting out with, like, Annabeth clearly likes Luke, and now that seems to not be the case, even though 
deep down, I don't think she'll ever stop having feelings for him. At the very least, like wanting him to be good and wanting him to not be on Kona Society. You know, we saw her vision and everything. Um, you know, you know, it's like part of her like perfect future is making Luke see reason on her side again. Um, I do think this, you know, this series so far has done, you know, a, a little cliche, but still very, very nice to see the whole like two people don't like each other and they're at each other's throats or whatever. They, they, uh, you know, they like rib on each other and then it's like, ah, but they, they have fondness for each other. So, um, we'll see if that grows into anything. Um, I don't really think this book, this series is really set up to have a lot of like romantic moments in it. That's not really what I see this, um, you know, like the, the intent with the characters and relationships and stuff, but you know, it'd be, it'd be nice to see again. I love a good friend group. I love a group of people that all like each other, like hanging out and they can, you know, again, I mean, even with, it's, uh, with a goal like this, where it's like, we have to stop Kronos from destroying the world, rebuilding it in his image. Um, it's very helpful to have a group of people who all know each other so well, um, that it helps in like, even like battle situations. So, um, just a small moment that I didn't remember happened. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's nice. I hope that grows into something. Cause I honestly don't remember. Um, and then another nice little physical, I guess not physical. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Just like feely emotionally moment was, uh, Tyson and Percy. Obviously they win. And another thing that happens because of that is, uh, Percy very openly being like, that's my brother, you know, um, very good stuff. Cause obviously camp didn't like Tyson for he's a Cyclops and all that. So, um, him, you know, re, you know, Percy exclaiming that and the camp, you know, now accepting Tyson is like, that's good that, you know, that is a change. That is something that Percy was able to do, you know, in this, this whole series so far, I feel like Percy's been very down on himself even earlier and we'll, you know, we will get to this. Well, I guess maybe we won't because we've already kind of talked about it, but with the whole prophecy thing, you know, Percy does talk to Chiron about it. Um, they have a very sad thing. Um, you know, destroy the world, save the world. Uh, I am Kronos' son or whatever, <laughs> you know, that, that whole stuff. Um, very surface level, not too much to talk about there, but, um, you know, one of the things that does come from that is that Percy is still very unsure of himself, even though all the incredible things he's done so far, like if he were to never do anything again, he still deserves to have his flowers, right? Like, you know, him, him preventing a civil war between the gods in the first book. Um, and now him getting the golden fleece back, uh, which also in turn, like, helps pan and, and like the satyrs movement um you know him bringing I mean, you know i guess indirectly bringing uh you know thalia back daughter of zeus that was a whole big moment that was obviously etched in stone because of the whole uh uh you know like policy the the, the like agreement that came out of that with the big three not having kids like he has affected directly and indirectly so many things at this point um, so for him to still be unsure of himself, it makes sense because it's like, well, I can't fight Kronos. <laughs> it's like, okay, yeah, maybe hand-to-hand -hand combat with Kronos probably won't win at this point. But um, you, you have to look at all the stuff you've done and even the smaller stuff like this where he was able to change the whole camp's perception of maybe not all Cyclops, but, but one Cyclops in particular. You know, I think even those small wins deserve to be lauded at times um and then also them just being brothers like you know there's a sad moment that that comes from all of this where you know you 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 know i think you're supposed to feel for their relationship even if it is a little complicated it is it does grow stronger and stronger as the book goes on but you you know i don't think you realize how strong you care for them together until the end comes and tyson is like i'm leaving you know, I mean, you know, even Percy is like a little jealous that Poseidon called for Tyson specifically, but that gets completely overshadowed by his, um, you know, his like, sadness, you know, from him, to him, him now gaining a brother and him finally really accepting him in that, um, you know, in that role. And now he's gone and you're kind of sad to you like, oh no, Tyson's gone. Like, what do we, <laughs> no, like obviously he's, he's going to help, right? 
in a very, very important way, but he's gone now, you know, and I wonder where, where we're going to see him again. I imagine we'll see him again. I don't think Rick is just like, that character was just for this book. Like, I think we'll see him again, but um, in what capacity, you know, are we going to, one of these books, we're going to make our way down to the underwater forges? Um, will something happen with the underwater forges and now Tyson has to come out, he like escapes or something? Um, or is it just like, it's time to battle? <laughs> it's like, all right, weapons are made now. Now everyone in there, including Tyson, can now be in the war or whatever. I don't know. We'll see. Um, let's see. Not too many more things. Uh, so I guess one moment that I did really like, and I guess it all ties together. So, um, Percy did trick Luke into confessing to Mr. D and the whole camp about, uh, the whole Golden Fleece situation. Uh, not the Golden Fleece, uh, the Thalia tree dying, like poison and all that stuff. Um, obviously really great because that clears Chiron's name and also puts even more of a, a target on Luke's back, you know, as if we needed more reasons. Um, but aside from that, I think it also shows how clever Percy can be, like, clearly in this, you know, this is why I said it ties into another thing I wanted to say, which is Luke definitely almost killed Percy. Like, if the party ponies and Chiron didn't come to save him, Percy, 99% chance would be dead because Luke, Luke was about to kill him. He stopped and said, all right, boys. Go ahead and kill all his friends. <laughs> I want, I want Percy to watch his friends be killed, and then I'm gonna kill him. Like, like that was about to happen. Um, but but Percy, you know, was able to be clever at least in that moment to get him to confess, get what he wants, all that stuff. Um, I think that just goes to show. The I mean, first off, unfortunately, it goes to show how far apart they are. You know, when it comes to skill. Uh, you know, Percy in the water is formidable, but when he's out of the water, he can't beat Luke. Like, Luke just has too much experience on him. He has too much, um, I mean, not only training experience, but also, like, real-life experience. Um, you know, then it kind of harkens back to what, what, what Chiron has been on Percy's back for for so long. Is like, train. Like, you need to train. You need to get better. Uh, but then that also kind of harkens back to something that Annabeth said, which is, um, you know, she's been in that camp for so long, but out there in the real world is where you get to know if you're good or not. So it's kind of like battling philosophies where it's like, yes, I think Percy does have to train more, does have to get better at combat, but how much does simulated combat really help you versus getting out in the world and being in a real life or death situation? You're, you're not going to die at camp, you know, campers aren't going to kill each other, um, in like a training scenario, but out in the real world, you actually have to fight, you know, and, th and that's also when like, I'm sure like adrenaline kicks in and everything, so it's like, oh, this is real, this monster in front of me could kill me right now, um, so yeah, um, and then just again, Luke, like how determined he is, like, th like that is kind of the nail in the coffin, um, where it's like, Luke is not coming back, like, like this is Luke's path, this is the the side that he has chosen and there's no convincing him um so yeah a lot of things kind of come out of this moment and like i said it does make you scared for percy because it's like if he's not in water and he has to fight luke again i don't know how he's gonna win you know luke could just kill him you know um probably won't at least not until the last book because again we know that this story is five books long not gonna die in book two <laughs> Uh, that would be crazy, but, uh, we'll see, you know, we'll see. And the last thing I have is interesting. Um, something I think was kind of just a throwaway line, but it, but I did, I did kind of hang on it for an extra couple seconds was, um, Polyphemus, you know, you know, you know, the kind of five, you know, fighting the Cyclops and all that, and him, him basically saying that, you know, he is a son of Poseidon, right? Like, 
you know, and like Percy making the very logical arguments about like, oh, you know, he's not going to hurt one of his kids. He's not going to hurt, you know, you know, the gods, uh, you know, you stole the fleece from them. This belongs to one of the gods' children or, or, or the gods' kids, gods' children, but, you know, whatever, right? Basically saying that like, this fleece should be used to heal, not to harm. You don't deserve it. You stole it, all that stuff. Very logical arguments from our perspective. Because, yeah, it makes sense. It's like, well, the gods or whatever would much rather have us have the fleece and use it to help their own children and, you know, all, all that stuff. You know, the tree's dying. Camp Half-Blood is dying. And Polyphemus makes a great point where he's like, but, but I'm, I'm a child of the gods. You know, and again, I feel like it's just a throwaway line. Um, and, and ultimately, I, I, I feel like Camp Half-Blood does need that fleece more and does deserve it more. Um, you know, especially with, you know, you, you, you kind of cross that barrier where it's like, he's making good points. But then it's like, oh, he uses the fleece to, to lure in satyrs, pretending to be Pan. Uh, whether he knows it or not, pretending to be Pan, luring in satyrs to eat them. It's like, eh. Mm, mm, you know, while well, Camp Half Blood is used to kind of train, got uh, you know the gods' kids, and you know sort of keep keep the world spinning, all that stuff. So, but up until that point, I think he makes good points. Where it's like, but I'm I'm also one of you, you know, like loosely and not in the same sense. But you know, Poseidon's also my dad, like why why are you different than me you know and again him trying to curse percy in the name of poseidon and percy being like well he's my dad he's not gonna he's not gonna curse me the same way he won't curse you you know but but then again that's almost percy proving polyphemus's point where it's like on one hand you can't say that we're nothing like you and we're better than you whatever and then on the other hand be like well, well we're the same you know we're, we're both poseidon's kids so your your, your, your curse cancels my curse um, again, I think the logic kind of breaks down once you get to, well, the intent with the Golden Fleece, very different between how Percy would use it and how Polyphemus has been using it. Um, but up until that point, you know, you know, I think the series does a very good job of making you distrust the gods. And at the end of the day, Percy and Camp Apple, all Apple, you know, Annabeth, Grover, others, Clarice, you know, all, all these ones, it's like, you want them to win and you know they are on the side of the gods just pure happenstance right because obviously gods are against chronos so they'd be you know um but there are lots of little moments where it's like we may be your children and we may have a common enemy in chronos but we don't necessarily like you like we love you because you're our fathers or our mothers or whatever but we don't necessarily like you um, you know, cause you even go back to a moment with Clarice, I don't remember if it was in the second half or the first half, maybe I already talked about this, I don't know, but with Clarice and Ares, where, where Ares was just like belittling her and being like, you better do this, you know, you, you better not let Percy take this from you, you know, oh, I should have, I should have had one of my sons take the quest or something, and, and Clarice is just like cowering because what is she going to do? I mean, that's not only her father, but it is Ares, you know? And, and Percy sees this, and, 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 and so from that scene, you're just kind of thinking, like, that's your kid, and you're talking to her, like, and, you're, and, and you're basically just, like, using her, and again, it's Aries, but that's not an excuse, you know, and then it rolls back to all the other moments where, like, there's moments where you, where, I mean, you know, Poseidon claiming Percy in book one, just, you know, for his own, uh, you know, for his own agenda, right, um, I don't know, it's all again the same way and I mean, this kind of ties into what i talked about earlier with with percy not settling on how he really feels about poseidon i like that that has persisted through book two we'll see book three book four book five whatever but like i like that they haven't um you know, just like bowed down and be like oh well they're they're gods they have their reasons you know they they have to make tough decisions it's like well yes but also no um they can be wrong and and they can be very selfish and so that's why and again this ties into the conversation that Chiron was having with Percy about the prophecy and, and all that stuff where it's like that's why you you know the world you when it comes to half-bloods but also Percy in particular 
you are so special because you are half woods. You live in both the mortal world and the, I don't know, immortal world, <laughs> whatever. Um, you know, you, you know, you kind of live in both. And, you know, I feel like that is true for what I'm talking about as well, where they're able to kind of ground both of them, both realities, you know, they're kind of able to see both sides, um, you know, so they're not completely with the humans and how they would think and how they would do things, but they're also not with the gods fully as well. Um, and I feel like you can see that with everybody. Like, like Percy and Annabeth, obviously, we've seen the most of, and you can see that with both their ideologies. Whereas, like, we don't really lean one way or the other. We're kind of in the middle, and we're kind of trying to carve our own path. Um, and we try to take advantage of both of our sides, but we're not, like, you know, again, we're not bowing down to the gods, but we're also not completely rejecting them as, you know, Luke does, right? And you can see how that how that turns out. Again, a, a, a very difference, stark difference in philosophies. And that just brings us all the way to the end again as well, where it's like, Thalia, how, how is she going to feel? Um, is she going to toss out the gods the same way Luke has? And again, for a very good reason, you know, honestly, if, if, if you look at it from, okay, Luke's perspective, I think, is weak because he's just like, like his, Luke's perspective, I feel like, is just, I want to be special and I'm not. And so I'm going to make myself special. And it's like, okay, like, I don't know, that, that seems kind of selfish because he, cause he was like, oh, they're, they're just putting me on a quest that Hercules has already done. It's like, okay, yeah, yeah I, I don't know. It, it it has very much like big family energy where it's like I have a lot of siblings so now I want to stand out and I feel like I haven't gotten the attention I deserve and so now I'm just gonna lash out whereas with Thalia I feel like she'd have a very good point (laughs) where she's like I didn't ask to be born and because I was born I got turned to a tree what that's that's not fair at all (laughs) you know she, she would have a very good reason um, but on the other hand, maybe, you know, maybe she sees reason, you know, maybe she is very, very, very generous and, and, you know, she's able to understand why all this happened and she understands that while, again, very similar to someone like Percy or Annabeth, maybe a little further, because again, she has a much better reason to dislike the gods and her father or whatever than maybe Percy or Annabeth does, but she's able to understand like, hey, you know, Kronos though, <laughs> Kronos is not the lesser of the two evils here, <laughs> you know, so I would hope so anyway, because, you know, I, again, like I said, I keep saying I love a good friend group, so Thalia being added into the mix, you know, see where her personality is and everything, be very cool, um, but yeah, that, I believe, is everything, though, that is Sea of Monsters, not only chapters 11 through 20, but that is the end of the book, so we will come in next week with book three, uh, Titan's Curse, as I already mentioned, Titan's Curse, uh, chapters 1 through 10, I'm gonna get through that, this is where, I think I mentioned this before, but, but like, this is where I, my mind gets a little fuzzy, right, books 1 and 2, I feel like I remember fairly well, small stuff, obviously, leaves, but, uh, from here on out, I don't really remember the series too much, like, some big moments, you know, I feel like they're still rattling around in there, but book 3, I'm like, I don't, Again, like, I think they go on a quest, you know, but even that isn't memory. It's just, well, book one, they want a quest. Book two, they want a quest. <laughs> book three, you know, if logic dictates <laughs> going on a quest, but, like, I don't remember what it is. Like, it probably something to do with Thalia because now she's awake and I feel like they wouldn't revive a character as important as that and not have it be, um, you know, vital to the next book's plot. Um, but yeah, we'll see. Uh, like I said, that is it. Uh, yeah, excited to read first half of the next book. Um, until next time, read those chapters. And, uh, you know, we'll see what happens with Thalia. Is she good? Is she bad? Will she be best friends? Uh, how, will she, how will she feel about Luke? How will she feel about Annabeth? Will Annabeth be jealous? They did introduce a little bit of, you know, you know, maybe just in the moment, never happened again, but maybe past number two was her getting a lot closer with Percy, and now Thalia's here. You know, I feel like we've already heard a little bit of jealousy 
when she refers to Thalia and how, how she thinks Thalia would act towards Percy. So we'll see. We'll see what happens.